That's enough of that, right? Good morning, guys. My name is John. I'm the pastor. There we go. I'm the pastor here at South Shore. It is great to welcome you into worship today and to have all of our elementary guys with us up until we send them off to small groups. Um, so we're glad that you guys are here. I want to lift up a couple of things to you. Trunk or treat. Most people are saying, well, I think I'm going to do that. I'm just not quite ready to sign up. Stop it. Sign up. Stop thinking about it. We need you. We need to know how many people are going to be here. We need our, our volunteers. We're working on all of that now. Don't wait till the last minute and make it difficult on my staff people. <laughs> the people I get to work with. Please go ahead and sign up for that as quickly as possible. Uh, charge conference, October 22nd. You can make that verbal announcement to you. And uh, last week was Pledge Sunday. And as our, our uh, leader of the stewardship committee comes on up, uh, we had a, a fair turnout, and so what it was, you know, like it usually is, about half of you got were remembered. And so we have uh, some stuff available for you in the lobby, and um, Denny's here to remind you of that. And we usually welcome Denny uh, with applause because we like him. It's all good news. Last year we had 79 uh, pledging family units. And last Sunday, Pledge Sunday, Faye and I weren't here, so we didn't turn our pledge in, and I'm in deep trouble. So I turned my pledge in, we turned our pledge in this morning, and I'm here to remind folks that there are pledge cards out there. If you didn't get them in the mail, uh, we have them here. To, uh, fill them out, turn them in on the offering, give them to me, or turn them into the office. And it's very important. When we signed up and committed to God to join this church, we committed to either praying, our presence, our gifts, and our service. And we got a lot going on. I'll be outside to answer questions on the master plan if you have any questions on that as well. So it's a great day. We got a lot of exciting things coming. And uh, just a reminder that uh, we need our pledges turned in. Thank you. Um, yesterday we started End Zone Sports, had their opening, su uh, opening season games yesterday. And we thought that because End Zone had been here last year already, that they would know how to park and, and all that kind of stuff. And I'm here to tell you, <laughs> there were cars, I worked with Nick Gill over here, there were cars in, on every square inch of anywhere that we could find to park people. And we burned a lot of calories yesterday <laughs> trying to get all that done. So if you would like to serve on a Saturday, choose one Saturday. Choose one Saturday a month. Whatever that you can do to help us to be good stewards of our property as well as welcoming our end zone families. I'm asking you to please call me and let me know because it was a hopping place here yesterday and it's a lot of fun and you get to work with Nick. That's right. Everybody wants to work with Nick, that nice, single, attractive young man. That's exactly um, right. <laughs> what time does that start and when does it end on Saturdays, the responsibility for parking? Um, we, we started at like 8 o'clock, 8 to 1, so, but the busiest time is like between 9 and 11. Great, so, so you can come and give two hours and you get a big help. Awesome. Absolutely. Thanks, Kevin. Absolutely. Well, thank you. So why don't you stand as you are able as we begin our service this morning with the call to worship. It is a responsive reading. I will begin and you respond with the words in white. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Who has brought us here to worship? The one who seeks our hearts and never relents. We are here to praise your name. With our whole hearts, we worship you. Amen. Amen. Right. What well, introduces the new song this morning? It's called Curious. You may have heard it in the list of Christian radio. It's not too difficult by the time we get to the second chorus. I hope you'll sing along.
song is furious. Your love is sweet, your love is wild, and you're waking hearts to life. Oh, your love is deep, your love is wide.
Lord, we pray for our church as she continues to grow and reach out into the community for every child that is fed over the weekend. Lord, we give you thanks. For every new family that we welcome onto our campus to play soccer and flag football, can we give you thanks? For the opportunity in Halloween to get kids together with their families and hand out candy and just let them know, you know, God loves you. And this is a safe place to come and explore a relationship with Him. God, we thank you. Creator, we ask that you would move in the midst of what's happening inside of our country. Those who I think in their hearts that they're doing the right thing and yet we've come to this impasse and people are hurting and God, I, I, I'm, I'm looking for it. So we ask that you would intervene and that you would change hearts, that you would sway votes, that you would do whatever is supposed to happen. Let's get on with it because the waiting is so hard. But God, even in the midst of these difficulties and in the midst of the waiting, help us to trust you. For it's not only in these places that we don't understand that, God, I, I have a hard time making sense of the way in which serving you is twisted into violence and hurting innocence and bombs exploding and fighting over territory. God, it's amazing. The death and destruction and the panic and the chaos that exists in this world. our struggle and in our worry and in our failing to understand, may we get a glimpse of your great love. May we get a glimpse that neither in death or in life, these troubles do not have to overwhelm us. And instead, we can be confident in who you are, that we can be covered by the power of your great we can know that our own failings do not have to cause us death and brokenness, that we can be healed from them, that our debt is paid, and that nothing ever can separate us from you. Nothing can really separate your creation from you. Lord, we trust you with today, we trust you with the future. And we pray that in this hour, we would hear your word clearly. We would be challenged to respond. And through the power of your Holy Spirit, we would be made a people who is salty, who is making a difference. That is the light of the world because you have sent the light of the world to us. And it is in his name that we pray. The prayer that his spirit continues to teach the people of God to pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
in our service to another response that we make to God for his love. And that is the offering of our tithes and offerings. And we will pray together as our worship support team um, gathers here up front. I would like to remind you that if you serve Jesus for at least an hour this week, then you place a salty service card along um, with your offering in the basket today. And as well as if you have your pledge card with you, we invite you to place that in the basket as well. Let us pray together. Holy God, your love does go on and on. Your love for us is something that we can hardly fathom. And we are so thankful to have this opportunity today to praise and worship you as we gather together as one body of Christ. Lord, we ask that you be with us as we give you our tithes, our tithes and our offerings today. And Lord, during this time of pledging and thanksgiving, Lord, we struggle, some of us struggle with giving you our first 10%, our very first fruits. Lord, we ask that you, in the midst of this struggle, remind us of your goodness, remind us of your grace and your mercy, remind us of who you are in our lives. Please take what we offer to you this morning and use it for your holy church, for your community, and for your world. Oh, children, right. 
Don't worry about the children. Um, uh, we, we do want to invite, uh, if you have registered your children uh, with our children's ministry, with Jeannie down here, uh, then now is the time that they will be heading out. If you haven't registered, then you can do that. Just make sure you get uh, situated with Jeannie so that you don't end up with somebody taking the wrong kid home. Or somebody saying, no, you guys keep them for a little while. And we'll make sure they all go home. So yeah, if you are, I think it's, what, what are the ages? To fifth grade? Fifth grade. All the way to fifth grade, you can head out now. And, uh, So, uh, so like I was saying, I, that means that I get to preach sometimes, and um, I want to start with, uh, with our scripture, which is probably a good place to start. It's from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 32. Uh, it starts with a he, so you need to know that the he is a guy named Jacob, okay? So uh, starting at verse 22, the same night, he got up and he took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him in the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. And then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask for my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him, and he passed to Newell, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the hip, do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket, because he struck Jacob on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. It's weird, don't worry. <laughs> So uh, I go out dancing a lot. I, I like to do swing dancing. In fact, I invited some of my swing dancing compatriots to come with me this morning, so I hope that you will welcome them well as I go <coughs> uh, And one night, uh, there's lots of dances. One of them's in Ebor on Tuesday nights. And Ebor is an interesting place because uh, until about 10 or 11 o'clock, Ebor has like burger joints and like clothing shops and a movie theater and it's like it's almost this family kind of place it's like nice and fun to be and then at about 10 or 11 o'clock things change <laughs> and so we were we were at a dance and uh, a group of us decided we wanted to go get some pizza after the dance and so we walked down to and it's kind of at a window it's not like you go in and sit down and we walked to the window there was like i don't know five of us or something like that and we all were ordering separately, and it was a late night for this guy, so he wasn't exactly in a hurry. It was taking a little while. So we all ordered, and, and I went last, because I'm a gentleman. And, um, and as, I, as I was kind of finishing up, and we were paying, and I was signing, and doing, getting the pizza and all that, apparently the person behind us was really frustrated. We didn't know, because we were busy doing our thing. And, uh, and she came up in between us. And she like kind of made way, and then she did this. Excuse you, and, like, shoot us out of the way. Now let me paint a picture for you. Because we were just finishing our night. We had been dancing, we were getting some food, and then we were gonna go home. She was just starting her night. And she was like done up. Okay, like leopard print, wedge heels, she was feeling good, she was looking good, and she was ready to go to the club, okay? And she was not about to have us taken, holding her up. And so she was ready to go. And so she came and she shoot, excuse you, and shoot us out of the way. Now, I have never encountered anything like that before in my life. And, and I wasn't even really upset. I was more like astonished, and so I kind of stepped out of the way, and I didn't know what to do. And in the genuine, honest, sincere reaction, I just did, what? what? And I had no idea what to say, and I just like, look at my face like, I have no idea what's going on here. So at that time, her, I guess her boo, her guy that she was with, 
who was a very large man, was standing here, right behind me. And he said, what's that look for? I went, oh, no. I had no idea what to do with that. And now here's the thing, like, I'm a black belt in Taekwondo, and I, I, you know, I practiced mixed martial arts for a while, and uh, the thing about mixed martial arts is that when I go to the gym, I'm like, I'm very comfortable wrestling and, and like fighting with guys who are bigger than me, because at an MMA gym, that's all there are. It's guys that are bigger than me. And so I got really comfortable. So, so the, my first reaction, again, wasn't like fear or like, oh no, I'm in trouble. My first reaction was, where am I? What is going on? Like, what, why do people want to fight me all of a sudden? And so I just, before I could even really think about how bad this could go, I just said, Hey, I'm sorry for the offense. I, I meant no. And he goes, what was that look for? And he interrupted me. And he was like starting to bow up. And I said, listen, this is not going to happen. I don't want any trouble. I'm not going to fight you. I apologize. And then she kind of intervened and said, you know, oh, no, it wasn't him, this and that. And then they kind of calmed down together. And we avoided the fight, which is, you know, the, when I looked back on it, and I started really thinking about it, like, the best case scenario for me is that I win the fight have legal problems, and I'm probably going to be on the hook for medical expenses. That's the best case scenario. And that's not even like in you know, talking about if I lose the fight, okay? So, so in hindsight, I'm like, yeah, it's this real kind of primal reaction that most people, especially people who have been punched in the face before, uh, have to fighting. It's like, this is a bad thing. I don't want to fight. I don't want to wrestle. I don't want to get hurt. So I think it's very interesting that one of the most uh, critical, central examples of relationship with God in Scripture is God wrestling with Jacob. God fighting. And I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but have you ever felt attacked by God? Have you ever felt at least abandoned and left hung out to dry by God? That's where Jacob is. Now the thing about Jacob is that Jacob's name literally means heel puller. Or something that we might understand a little bit better, leg puller, chain yanker, swindler, con artist. That's who Jacob is. He's a liar and a cheater and a manipulator. And he gets what he wants with his silver tongue. In fact, when, when he and his brother were young, he has a, an older twin brother. His brother came out first. And so even though they're twins, he's the older one. And that means that he's going to get the inheritance. It means that he's going to get God's blessing that's passed down through the generations. It means that he is set up for life, to be life, you know, abundant and good and wealthy and all this stuff. And at a young age, Jacob actually, with his nothing but his mouth, convinces his brother Esau to give up his inheritance for a bowl of stew. You see who Jacob is? Jacob's a talker. He's a trickster. And later, Jacob approaches his father in the guise of his brother and convinces his father, tricks him, cons him, into passing down the blessing to Jacob rather than Esau. And Jacob steals Esau's inheritance and his generational blessing, which is the most coveted thing in the family. He cons his family out of the things which are most precious. That's who Jacob is. And so Jacob naturally has to run. He has to flee because his brother's been murdered. He's stolen everything. He's destroyed everything. And so Jacob flees, and he finds himself in love with a girl, like most young men find themselves. And again, using the power of negotiation, the power of words, he works out a deal to work seven years to get this young beauty, this bride. And the father of the bride tricks him. And she married, and he ends up marrying the wrong sister, the older sister rather than the younger sister. And so once again, Jacob not giving up, he, he works out another deal where he gets the younger sister as well for another seven years. And this is who Jacob is, his tolerance, he's constantly getting what he wants. He's constantly working the angle. And then later, when it's time to start having children, the woman he doesn't love is the one who's bearing him sons. And the woman he loves is not bearing him any sons. And man, in that culture, at that time, that's the worst thing you could ever ask for. And so the woman he loves sends her maidservant to him so that hopefully he can get her pregnant instead. And he does, and he has more kids. 
And then the woman he doesn't love says, that's a good idea. We should have more kids that way. So she sends her. So now Jacob's got four women and 11 kids. And he's always trying to work the system. He's trying to get what he wants. When it's time for him to leave, he goes to his father-in-law. He says, all right, I've I got to go. So I'm going to take you know, part of the family stuff. And he works it out, again, through conning and trickery. He stacks the deck so that all of the, the young, nubile, fertile goats end up on his side. And all the kind of runts and the, and the bad goats end up on his father-in-law's side. And he tricks and swindles and, and cons his father-in-law out of everything that's most precious to him. His wealth, his family, his daughters. That's who Jacob is. He's somebody who goes after what he wants and he does it on his own and he uses his, his wit and his charm and his, his gift with words to get what he wants. On his way back, he gets word that Esau, remember Esau, the brother he conned out of everything. He gets word that Esau is coming to meet him with 400 soldiers. And all Jacob has is his family, his servants, and his goats. And Esau is coming to destroy everything. And that's where we, where we pick up the scripture. Jacob is alone by the bank of a river. And the next morning, he is going to face his destruction at the hands of his brother, who he stole everything from him. I said I was going to hopefully be a pastor. And part of that process is kind of reflecting on your own gifts and uh, one of the things that I remembered about my own life is when I was in college, I, I played in a, I started up a band. We called, we called ourselves Comic Book Villains. And it's, uh, it's a good name because everyone who ever heard it was like, oh, I've heard of you guys. I didn't have it, but I'll take it. <laughs> and uh, the first uh, formation of this band was uh, me and a bass, bass player and a drummer. And, uh, and I don't know how I talked to these guys into being on board with what I was doing, but the drummer of that band is now uh, the band leader for Gavin DeGraw. He's a touring musician, he's phenomenal, he's one of the best guitar players I've ever met in real life, I mean, he's just an outstanding musician. And so he, he kind of moved on, and, and the next guys that I kind of convinced to come to the band were another drummer and a keyboard player, and now they write musicals on and off Broadway in New York. Yeah, I'm like, they're really good, I, who knew? And then uh, I started playing in a college ministry, and uh, the drummer in that band is now the drummer for The Almost. And I don't know if you've heard them, but they're on Joy FM and Spirit FM. And he's like a touring national Christian recording artist. And, uh, and then when I started another band at my home church, Adona, it was time for us to kind of split into another worship band. And the guy that I convinced to come play drums used to be the bass player for the Commodores. <laughs> Like, and I just found myself everywhere that I went when I built these bands. Like I, my gift. I'm like, like I'm actually not a very great musician. My gift is that I convince all these really good musicians to let me front the band. <laughs> and you can see that here. Yeah, I mean, we've got a freaking phenomenal drummer. We've got a phenomenal guitar player, piano player. We also have other volunteer musicians who have said, I play flute. And I say, great, here's a bass guitar. <laughs> that, that's how we built our band. You know, we, and it's just constantly trying to get the right people on board. Now, here's the thing about that. And, and let me be a little honest here. I have no idea how that happens. I genuinely have no idea how and why that happens. And as I look back on my life, I have a track record of it. And I like to say, and when I'm in job interview situations, and when I'm talking about my gifts, I say, I have a track record of building good teams. That's what I do. I build good teams. I mean, look at our youth program. When, when we first started our youth program, it was built on the backs of really committed, really gifted adult volunteers. And now that's a legacy that Corey continues. And so the whole great thing about our youth program was getting good, small group leaders. I build good teams. Here's the problem with that. I become Jacob. Because if you really ask me what's going on there, I have no idea. I have no idea. You want to know how I got grandma and grandpa leg to come and be small group leaders? I went to them and I said, please come, I need you. If you don't come, I don't know what I'm going to do. And they came because they loved me. I have no idea how I'm convincing these people to come and do what they do. 
And, and the thing that scares me about that is because what, what's really going on at the heart of that is that it's something that God does. It's, not, it's something that I get to be a steward of. It's something that I try to invest in good ways. But the real truth of it is, is that I don't actually own it. And the thing that scares the ever-living you-know-what out of me is that I have to go do this in a year or two. I'm going to have to go do this somewhere else. And I'm not really sure that I can do it again. Because I don't know how it happens. And, and that's the tricky part about depending on God. See, we're stuck in these one of two places. Either I can own it and say, no, I build good teams. I convince people to come and play with me and come on my team. And they come, and they come because of me and who I am, and that's something I own and control. The only problem is I end up feeling like Jacob. I end up feeling like I'm wearing a mask all the time. I end up feeling like nobody really knows who I am because the whole time on the inside I'm going, please don't ask me how. I have no idea what I'm going to say to that question. And don't ask me to do it again because I just got lucky this time. And I don't actually have any real relationship with anybody else or with God because I'm faking it the whole time. But see, the other option doesn't sound much better. Because the other option is, now this is something that God does. And when I go in a year or more from now to go do this somewhere else, I'm going to be totally dependent on God to show up again. And here's the problem with that. God and I don't always agree on what good is. Because I have had times in my life where I have cried out to God for protection, for providence, for the things that I know I need. And he has been silent. He has said nothing. And what he says is good is not what I say is good. And I find myself in places of my life going, where are you? Why aren't you being the God I want you to be? And he won't. He stays the God he is. So what are we supposed to do with this? Because God wants our hearts. He doesn't want us to just be blindly obedient. He wants us to be obedient, but to, to do it with a full heart that seeks after him. And what's the answer? The answer is God attacks. The answer is that we are not put in a corner and, at, and told to remain silent. The answer is that when I find myself going, I can't find you, God. Where are you? Who even are you? God says, let's wrestle. Let's go round and round. You and me are going to settle this right now. And that's what happened with Jacob. Jacob spent his whole life running from God, doing on his own, separating himself from the people he loves. And God finally catches him in this most vulnerable, darkest, lowest time. And he says, you and me are going to go round and round all night until we get this settled. And somehow, in God's just perfect brilliance, through Jacob actually winning the fight, God gets Jacob to a place where he holds on to God so tight, and he says, I will not let you go. God's kind of brilliant sometimes. And Jacob says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And God says, what's your name? He says, my name is Trickster. My name is Chain Yanker. My name is Con Artist. And he says, you're not going to be Jacob anymore. You're going to be Israel. And the word Israel literally means to struggle and wrestle with God. This is our legacy. It's not a legacy that says, get in the corner and do what you're told. You're supposed to blindly obey the law and don't ask questions because you don't have permission to question the Almighty God. That's not the relationship we have. We have a relationship that says, you and me are going to wrestle. You and me are going to go round and round. And when we're done, you're going to walk out of here with a limp. See, Jacob leaves that place having to lean, needing a crutch. He walks into that place having done everything on his own, having done everything by the, the, the smoothness of his talk, getting everything he ever wanted from life by tricking people, and he walks out of that place limping, leaning, dependent. This is, the, is what will define Israel's relationship with God from then on. When Israel is enslaved, it's God who gives freedom. When Israel is in the desert and needs food, it's God who gives bread and water. When Israel comes to the promised land and they see giants in the land that they can't hope to defeat, it's God who delivers victory. They will forever now be dependent 
upon the God of angel armies to deliver them from sin and darkness and death. So in those moments of struggle, when we wrestle with God, when we can't find who you are and what is going on, and you and I don't agree on what good is, we actually have permission to go after a God who is so loving and unrelenting. And, and the problem with it, honestly, is that wrestling with God, it goes from this, real quickly, to this. Hello? This. Now, at first, this looks like this guy is just having his way with his kid. There's a story behind it. In, in Japan, the sumo wrestlers are rock stars. They're superstars. And before every match, they ask little kids to come down and, and wrestle with them. And what you can't tell from that picture is that the kid is actually smiling. There's lots of different pictures of, of that happening, and, and the sumo wrestlers grab them, and they spin them around, and the kids smile and love it because they're in the hands of a professional athlete. I mean, they look like big, sloppy dudes, but they're actually some of the most technically skilled, most kinesthetically aware athletes that there are in that country. And what's actually going on is this kid is in the hands of a gentle, professional giant. He's in the hands of an expert. And when we wrestle with God over where are you, what were you doing, why didn't you show up, we are actually in the hands of a perfect, loving father who loves us so much that he gives us permission to come and yell and wrestle and question, who loves us so much that though he is perfect, he did not even spare himself from the suffering of this world, that he came to suffer alongside of us, to be with us in the darkness and the pain and the turmoil, to be with us in such a way that, that he knows what it's like to be betrayed, to be tortured, to even die. This is the God we wrestle with. This is the God we have permission to approach. So my hope and my prayer for all of us is that when we walk out of here, we will walk with a limp. That in the places where we're not sure who God is and what God's doing, and where God and I don't agree on what good is, that we will not run away from God. That we will not lean on our own insight and our own words and our own strengths and the way we've always done it, but instead... We will go round and round with a God who loves us so much he is willing to die for us. Who loves us so much that he says, let's wrestle. And in that wrestling, may we find dependence. May we find a God who is faithful. May we find a God who can lead us to the edge <clears throat> without fear. This is my hope for all of us. Please pray with me. Lord, we, we are humble, we are broken, we are sinful. We have lots of places in our lives where we, we have botched it. We have made poor decisions. We have leaned too much on our own efforts. And instead, Lord, we've neglected the voice that always calls us to lean on you. So, Lord... Reveal yourself to us. Meet us in the places where we don't know who you are. We don't recognize you. We don't know your name even. Meet us in the places where we can't even fathom how you could call this good. And don't let us go. Wrestle us to the ground. Fight with us until we know you to be the God you say you are. Until we know that you have got us and we've got you. And Lord, from that place, may we walk away dependent with a limb, trusting in you. We ask all of this in your son's name. Amen. And now our worship support team is going to be coming around and they're going to be handing out our attendance pads. If you have been at South Shore before, we ask that you fill out the white side. And if you are a guest at South Shore for the first time today, we invite you to fill out the green sheet. And let us know the best way to contact you if you would like to be contacted this week. And while the attendance pads are going by, we encourage you to write down on there if there is a place in your life where you are struggling, that you'd like to talk to a pastor or a staff member about that. 
one of the reasons why we're here. We would like to be able to help you with that. So take a few moments to fill out your attendance packs. Make 
his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you, may attack you when you need it. May you have permission to wrestle with him in the places where you're most fearful, where you're most doubting, and may you walk away from that with a limp, trusting in a God who loves you relentlessly. Amen.